Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. Christ is the door. The keys of the kingdom open the door. So clearly, Christ is the way in. And there's something you got to know about Jesus to open that door. And when you do, you have the keys of the kingdom. And then you, your family, your friends will know precisely what it takes to be saved, to have eternal life. And it's all thanks to Jesus Christ, God, the eternal son, second person of the Holy Trinity. He did all this for us, and it's a wonderful thing. And then, after that portion, which we'll get to right away, I'll discuss this asymmetric Janus parallelism, that Roman mythical God on the right, they use that as a technical term for a double entendre that looks back into the past and looks forward into the future. It has nothing to do with Roman myth. It's just the technical term that uh, we use to identify this particular uh, double entendre. Now, for those of you in a real, real hurry, there's the keys right there. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter confessed those, and Christ declared him blessed. Now, why is it that he said, I will give you the keys? Well, that's because we all live on a linear, temporal, finite level of existence. God, however, is an eternity. For example, there's a text that says that Christ was slain at the foundation of the world. Even though we know that happened in the first century, than when he was crucified. But from God's perspective, things are eternal and time doesn't really matter like it does for us. From God's perspective, when he confessed that Jesus is the Christ, son of the living God, that is the word of faith, which according to Romans chapter 10, verses nine through 11, when you confess that publicly with the heart, man believeth on the righteousness, with the mouth confession is made on his salvation. He did it publicly. He was saved at that time. Christ declares him blessed. But from a point of view of time, there's a timeline here. It has to await for the resurrection of Christ. Only after Christ rises from the dead did that channel of God's grace come into existence. That door into heaven, the keys, that living water that comes from the massive petro rock of Christ, and then there's the little lively stones that the church is, and they also give out living water because out of their bellies flow living water. Well, that channel of God's grace where the keys exist didn't exist until Christ rose from the dead and began building his church. So building the church and getting the keys is put into the future, but that's from our linear, finite point of view. From the eternal perspective of God, Peter was born again right here, and Christ declared him blessed. So those are the keys. If you got no more time and you want to end here, hey. But chances are you're not sure if I'm telling you the truth or not. You don't know if I'm right. So you're going to have to stick with me a little longer. I'll prove it to you. Okay, unfortunately, I'm not an expert video maker. They would know how to talk and then show you text at the same time so you're not distracted. I don't. You will have to pause this video so you could read these two contexts, take as long as you like, and when you're done, you'll restart it, and then I'll discuss these two. Right now, I just want to say real quick, the top one is about a guy building on the teachings of Christ. The bottom one is about Christ building on the teachings of the Father. I've color-coded everything. Take your time. You will notice that the symbols are actually the same in both contexts. But pause the video now. Take your time and read it thoroughly. Now, I hope you've read them both. The top one is the wise man building on the teachings of Christ. That's like building on a rock. 
And when the rains and floods come, because it was founded on a rock, it fell not. Now on the bottom, Christ is building his church on the teachings of the Father, that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter confessed that teaching, and when he did, Christ broke out into a macarism. A, he said, blessed art thou. Now he never did that before. Whenever uh, people said before this that you are the Christ, Son of God, it was because it was of men. It was not of the Father. When it's of men because of fear or awe, it doesn't change you. You aren't regenerated. You aren't born again. But whenever God the Father reveals Jesus Christ to you, you are changed on the inside. And that's why thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Those are the keys of the kingdom. And we're going to discuss that. And if you want to pause the video again and, and ponder this, you will notice that this is an apples-to-apples apples comparison. I've color-coded the things that are basically the same. The symbols are the same in both contexts, even though it's just slightly different. The theme and the symbols actually is pretty much the same thing. These sayings of mine, Christ is God the Eternal Son, second person of the Holy Trinity. Whatever he says is divine revelation, and it's therefore immutable, because God never lies. What he teaches doesn't change. So the teachings of Christ never change. It's immutable. Same thing with the revelation that the Father in heaven gave to Peter. Thou art the Christ, Son of the living God. That is unchanging truth from the God who cannot lie and it's about the identity of the immutable Son of God so therefore it's unchanging to the nth degree that's building the house on a rock on the bottom it's building the church on a rock and notice on the top the way Christ set this up Whosoever heareth these sayings of mine is being likened to a wise man who builds on a, his house on a rock. So rock is a metaphor for Christ's sayings. Confirming that, we could look at it this way. The wise man is building on these sayings of mine. Whosoever heareth is building his house upon a rock. Hearing what? these sayings of mine. So metaphorically, the words in blue, divine revelation, the sayings of Christ, that is the green Petra rock. Now you could watch a rock your entire life, it would not change one bit. And if you watched a rock after rains, floods, and winds blew against it, that didn't change it either. So building your house on a rock is like building upon immutable unchanging truth of God. No matter what comes against it, God will never change his teachings, nor will any of God's truth be altered by anything that the devil or this world hurls against it. So if you build your house upon God's unchanging, immutable, solid, foundational truth, then your house built on that will stand the trials that come against it. Now it's the same metaphor top and bottom. Rock is being used of something that is solid. You build upon it and it does not fall. On the top it was the forces of nature that didn't prevail and on the bottom it's the gates of hell that cannot prevail. So you're building on it on uh, something solid can't be affected by the, uh, the forces arrayed against it. It will never change. It will not be undermined. Like a house would, if a flood came along and the foundation was built on sand, the whole house washes away. But if it's built firmly on the rock, it stands. So if it's built firmly on the truth of God, and on the top that was these sayings of mine, and on the bottom it's the, the teachings of the Father, Thou art the Christ, Son of the living God, that's the only thing that's possibly 
rock-like in these in both these contexts now what about peter some say no he is the rock in verse 17 christ declared peter blessed by verse 23 christ says to him get behind me satan so something had been undermined in peter something totally controverted subverted what was washed away well his confidence he went from believing in the divine revelation of God, boldly proclaiming the truth of God, that if any man will hear, he will live, to repeating a lot of the arguments of the devil. And he's now he's, in effect, trying to sway Christ from his mission. So Jesus says, get behind me. Get in my rearview mirror. I got things to go. I got places to go, and I'm going ahead, and I want you behind me where I can ignore you like I do the devil. So Peter is not rock-like. He had totally been subverted right there. How about his confession? People point to the confession. Oh, yeah, that's rock-like. On the night of the trial, during the crucifixion, Peter denied Christ three times. He took that confession back. He revoked it. He, he didn't, When a maid came along, she so terrified Peter, he blurted out he didn't know who he was. And then another maid came along, and he did the same thing. And someone in the crowd says, wait a minute, you got the same accent. And that's when he started cursing, and he denied Christ. Three times before the cock crowed, he took it back. So there is nothing rock-like about Peter, nothing rock-like about his confession. The only thing rock-like here, the solid foundational truth of God that you could build a church upon, and no matter what was came against that church, it would stand, is the truth of that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's immutable truth from the God who never lies, foundational truth of the faith. It's upon that that the church is built. And some will still cling to Peter as the rock. They'll say, oh, well, Christ didn't know that Peter was going to get all shook up in the next few minutes. So, uh, uh, but that's not, that's impossible. Jesus is God, the eternal son, two natures, fully God, fully man. He knows everything. There's nothing that's impossible for him. There we see on the very bottom, if you need to pause the video, remember, anytime you need to pause the video to read, please do so. Because I don't know how to make videos, and I'm sure there's a real classy way to do this, but I don't. I'm relying on you to pause the video whenever you want to study the screen and read what is there, and then you can listen to me later. But there on the very bottom, it says, Jesus predicted that Simon would deny him three times, and that was well into the future. So when Peter was starting to talk like the devil, and Christ said, get behind me, Satan, Jesus knew that would happen when he declared him blessed. But Christ doesn't betray that or, or confuse us because we live in a linear spatial time. So he lets things unfold before he reacts. But clearly, we're dealing with God, the eternal Son. Nothing's going to surprise him. About now, you're wondering why there's so much dispute about this verse. It seems pretty simple to us. You have the same thing in Matthew 7, 24, that you have in Matthew 16, 16 through 18. The same basic universal symbols. Why can't, why the dispute? Well, some people look at that Sermon on the Mount at the top, Matthew 7, 24, 25, and they think it's prophecy. And because they think it's prophecy, they don't connect it with the bottom part. It's like two separate things to them. But it's wrong to think of it as prophecy. It's not. It's Sermon on the Mount teaching. And the symbols just mean what they mean. You're building on the teachings of Christ, then you built your house on a rock, and when the, the rains and floods come, that's uh, figurative for the troubles of life, or maybe the attacks of the devil, and then your house will stand, because it's founded on the rock of the teachings of Christ. That's, 
It's not prophecy. It's not talking about what's going to happen in the future. Unfortunately, some people think it does mean that. Now, that bottom is a quote out of the an exegetical summary of Matthew 1 through 16. I, I actually like that. I use it quite a bit. What they do is they summarize what the major commentaries, and these are high-dollar, top-shelf commentaries, what they have to say about a text. And it's helpful because you're getting their great wisdom all in a nice short form, nice short paragraph. And notice what they have to say about the floods and storm, what they represent. Now you could see what the, a lot of the scholarships say about this text, and they think it's prophetic. And pause the video, or and then go ahead and read what they believe the floods and storm represent. Now all those quotes are from the exegetical summary of uh, Matthew 1 through 16. That's a great book. I, I use it quite a bit. You get all these little quotes from the major commentaries, and uh, you get all that wisdom in one simple paragraph. And if uh, you see something you think is uh, needs to be looked at a little closer, then you go to the major commentary and you find it. So this is pretty helpful. Uh, but as you notice, all these high dollar, big name commentaries, they think this is prophetic, that the storms, the floods and storm represent final judgment, ultimate ordeal, death itself. Uh, last days of judgment or some kind of upheaval in the last days and that's ridiculous actually because that's just sermon on the mount prophecy on the top Christ is just saying hey when the troubles of life come against you if you founded your life upon my teachings it's not going to wash you or your faith away. You will stand. And you know, you read about it all the time. Terrible things happen to people. And you'd wonder, why does God let that happen? Well, unfortunately, Adam and Eve chose to rebel against God. And we got kicked out of paradise. That's why it happens. It's our fault. It ain't God's fault. But he at least opened the door in Christ. You walk through it, and then you can get out of this uh, terrible situation we're in. And he's going to return soon. Now pause this video to check out the two-way genre that presented in the context below it, where God calls uh, heaven and earth witness. You're supposed to choose life. Now, if you choose death, well, <laughs> it's terrible. So you got two ways to go. You, you got the good way and you got the bad way. Same thing on the bottom. Christ said, enter by the narrow gate for wide and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many go in by it. You're supposed to choose the narrow gate, the difficult way, because that leads to life. That's called two-way genre. And that is what the top context is. It's basically two-way genre. It's not prophecy. The wise man builds on the house the sayings of Christ. The unwise man does not build on the sayings of Christ. And guess what happens? His house collapses. Whenever the rains and the floods and the winds blow, it falls because he didn't build his house on the teachings of Christ, the rock that never changes. But pause the video, check this out, and you'll realize this is not prophecy. It's just two-way genre teaching. And by the way, that bottom one is actually part of the Sermon on the Mount. You notice it's in verses 13 and 14 of the same chapter. So it's right there. Christ, just a few minutes earlier, talked about this two-way enter through the narrow gate, the difficult way because it leads to life. If you choose the broad way, you're not going to get eternal life. But pause the video, check it out. Confirm for yourself, it's not prophecy. Now I put a new context in here, right in the middle, Ephesians 6, 10 through 12. Pause the video, read it a few times, and then we'll discuss it a little bit. But take your time, read it, then restart the video. 
Now, Paul is looking at that Matthew 7, 24, 25 context, and he's reworking the material for his little sermon here in Ephesians 10 through 12. You'll notice, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. That's the teachings of Christ, these sayings of mine. That is the rock. If you're strong and you build upon that, then you can withstand the rains, the floods, and the winds that come, spiritual wickedness in high places. You see how the two concepts, they parallel each other. This, Paul is reworking that material in 7.24.25 for his little sermon there, and he may have gleaned a little bit from Matthew 16.18 uh, when he said uh, Jesus said the gates of hell, so he's connecting the gates of hell with the spiritual wickedness from high places, the winds, the rains, the floods, they come from heaven or from the sky, you should say. But the point I'm making here is Paul does not see Matthew 24, 25 as if it's prophecy. It's just Sermon on the Mount teaching, and he's reworking that material for his sermon. Basically, to teach the same thing Christ did in Matthew 7, 24, 25. Now pause the video and read these new contexts there in the middle. And just notice the symbols or the theme is still being used. All this material is being reworked. They're all the same. But it's, it's not pro prophetic. It's just... Uh, well, now you could say uh, Revelation might be prophetic. Yes, it is. It's uh, apocalyptic. But we're discussing the symbols here about wind and rains representing spiritual wickedness in high places. Or the serpent, he casts water out of his mouth after the woman who represents the church. So that's like the gates of hell coming against the church. Or in Second Samuel, you read about the, the ways of death, the floods of Belial. Now, Belial is another name for the devil, as you can see from the next context. It says in 2 Corinthians, what accord has Christ with Belial? But when you check all that out, you see that we're not really talking about prophecy. We're dealing with symbols, and that Matthew 7, 24, 25 is just Sermon on the Mount, and Christ used these symbols in a particular way, and it's pretty common in the Bible to use these symbols that way. That's why when we get to Matthew 16, 16 through 18, we shouldn't be all that confused. We should be able to just read it, follow Christ's lead, and understand the symbols precisely as our only infallible teaching authority, Jesus Christ. He alone is our master. The rest of us are brothers. We need to heed and follow Jesus Christ. He set it up in Matthew 7, 24, 25, and we shouldn't vary from that when we get to Matthew 16, 16 through 18. But go ahead and pause the video. And that's true. There's a lot of these slides where I don't say that, but you should. If you want to study the screen and you don't want to hear me talking while you're doing it, please pause the video and then restart it when you're ready. Unfortunately, I didn't know how to make the video professionally and, and keep these things uh, smooth. So I depend on you to pause it when you want to read the screen. And then after you restart it, you can listen to me. And that way you'll, you'll, uh, you'll get what I have to say. So logically speaking, this is apples to apples. The four universal ideas common to both. They're color-coded, and then you have a, the same theme, building on the rock. One, it's Christ. The other one's the wise man. It's a wrap. There are no incompatible properties relevant to uh, Petra, nothing pertinent that would stop that being a metaphor for unchanging divine revelation in both contexts, the sayings of Christ or the revelation of the Father to Peter, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And we know from other texts, when you believe in Christ, you're saved. So that clearly is how the church is being built. 
It's being built on that precise content. Those are the keys to the kingdom. The reason why Peter didn't get them at this point in time is because in our linear existence, they didn't exist then. They only exist when the channel of God's uh, grace is created. The door opens from heaven. It goes through the uh, Christ to the church and out into the world. Until that happens, the keys technically didn't exist, and they, that would only happen after the resurrection of Christ. The keys did not exist apart from the channel of God's grace. Therefore, when Peter received the keys, it implies he had become a Kepha Petros lively stone of the church. Now, someone might say, I just don't see Peter being born again right here. Well, look at verse 17. Christ broke out into a macarism. Blessed art thou. Now, he never did that before. It's true that people before had said, you are the son of God, but they did in response to something Jesus said or did. And Christ never reacted like this when they did it, because it wasn't really a genuine conviction, a statement of belief. When Peter confessed this, and it's the product of divine revelation, never happened before, it's clear that he was believing it in his heart and confessing it with his mouth and that he was saved. And the confirmation of that is the way Christ saw in Peter a parallel to the prophet Jonah. Now, some people will say, where did you see that? Well, I see it in that Aramaic word bar Jonah. Why didn't Matthew translate that into Greek? He didn't. That's like putting a neon sign around that word. Look at this word. It's important. And in this context, it clearly means more than just son of some dude named Jonah. Bar in Aramaic or, or Ben in Hebrew means like a son of, after the order of. Look down at the bottom. Christ often looked at Jonah and saw parallels to what people were doing. He saw a parallel to what he would do when he was in, the, in hell for three days and three nights to what Jonah did when he was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Jonah writes that he was in hell when he was in that belly of the fish, and then the fish spit him out on a dry land. That's figurative of a resurrection. And then he went to the city of Nineveh preaching divine revelation that if any man would hear would live well look at peter he figuratively rose from the dead when he confessed the word of faith believing in his heart the lord jesus and he confessed it publicly so he's born again figuratively rises from the dead and now he's preaching the divine revelation that jesus is the christ son of the living god which if any man will believe and confess they will live. So Christ calls him Simon Bar Jonah, son of the prophet Jonah. It's right here. There's the confirmation is there. And then there's another confirmation. But it's it's more tenuous. Paul writes about well, God is faithful even if he is faithless. Well, even if Paul, you know, you, when you read Paul's writings, you realize he, there was no point in time when he was faithless. And once he became a Christian, I mean, he was just there. He clearly, very likely, I should say, was thinking about Peter. Peter here is born again. He confesses Jesus is the Christ, Son of the living God. He's born again. But a few days later, he denies Christ three times. Paul is looking at this event and the denial of Christ, and he's thinking, okay, eternal security because even though peter revoked his confession god could not deny himself so here if you wanted proof for eternal security it's right here in peter's confession and in paul's words i think you put them both together and then you have eternal security proof for it like i have never seen before let's move on now, if you folks who just wanted the keys to stick it with me, you'll enjoy this because it confirms a lot of what I've already said. 
we're just going to walk real quickly through the parallels that prove Paul is thinking about the Matthew event, 1616, when he wrote Romans 10, verses 6 through 11. Let's look at the equivalence here. They just slightly word differences, but the idea is the same. To bring Christ down from above, Paul can't see Christ without seeing salvation. So bringing Christ down from above is bringing the truth of salvation, that what saves you, from heaven. Well, what did the Father do when he revealed the identity of Jesus Christ to Peter? He brought Christ down from above, put it in his heart, and put it in his mouth. So when the Father revealed to Peter that Jesus is the Christ, Son of the living God, that is like the Word being near him, even in his mouth and in his heart. It just appeared there. And confirming that, it's the Word we preach, the Word that the apostles preach, the Lord Jesus. What is, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God? The identity of Christ? The Lord Jesus. It's the same thing. Clearly, Paul is you reworking that material for his own little sermon right here. Yeah, I've already mentioned it. Rima, 2 Corinthians 12, 4, is used of those unspeakable words not lawful to utter that someone heard in heaven, and uh, so it's divine revelation. And that's what thou art the Christ, Son of the living God, that's divine revelation. It's the word the apostles preach, the Lord Jesus. You can see the connection. The parallels are clear. The dependency is clear. Well, now it's going to get a little more technical. You folks that just wanted the keys of the kingdom and wanted to know what exactly you had to do to be saved. So you can go out there and save family and friends. And you got them. Precisely. Thou art the Christ, Son of the living God. You believe in your heart. You confess that with your mouth publicly. You're saved. The door to heaven swings wide open. Now we're going to go to the asymmetric Janus parallelism in Matthew 16, 18. And hopefully you Catholic and Protestants, you apologists, and you scholars, you all have put aside all your theories about this text, this context, and are now suspending that, that jump to disbelieve anything I say. After all, I am a cab driver, so who the hell am I? Just suspend that and just give me the length of this video to check out what I have to say. I believe I'm going to make my case uh, fairly well. And by the time at the end of this video, if you're a critical thinker, you might realize that I have made a good case. And whether you believe it or not, that's still up to you. But I'm going to make a good case from my point of view. That's coming up. So if you enjoy that kind of thing, even if you don't want to believe me, hey, you might really want to hear this argument because then you'll be entertained. You'll be intellectually challenged. Let's get cracking. Now, this is just an outline of the argument that we're going to go through. I, I don't expect you to read it. Please don't even try. Just remember it's over here in slide 21, and I'll repost it at the very end so you, you'll have it there too. And, you know, then that might help you uh, go through my argument. You'll see some of the points. Now, there is the Janus monster. It's asymmetric because the faces are slightly different when you're looking past or when you're looking forward. It's a parallelism because the act of looking back is exactly the same as looking forward, so that's a parallel. A polysemy is a word, it's a homonym, a word with more than one meaning. Rock. Dwayne Johnson, the actor, he's a rock. And Alcatraz, that's a rock. So you put it in a modern parallelism. The rock liberated its prisoners. Now, if you came upon that sentence and you didn't realize it was an asymmetric Janus parallelism, you wouldn't be able to interpret it. It would be inexplicable. You would think, well, a rock is inanimate, and the, the pronoun proves that you're not talking about a person, so... How could it be? But once you realize it's asymmetric Janus parallelism and you're aware that it's a homonym and you know those meanings, then you know that the rock, meaning Dwayne Johnson, liberated its referring to Alcatraz. So you have that forward backward look. This guy, Cyrus Gordon, discovered these in 1978 and they've been causing translators problems 
up until this time. Now, some of the ancient translations actually realized and translated them correctly, but a lot of them had a problem because they would see that more meaning in the Hebrew than what they could actually translate legitimately because they're trying to focus on one meaning. And when they do that, they lose all that other content. And we'll see that in the next example. Now, I didn't buy Cyrus Gordon's book. The scholars are finding these all over the place. I have no idea what the latest state of the art is on this. But this is the way I interpret this example. And it is one of uh, Cyrus Gordon's examples. Zamir is the hominum. Looking back, it means pruning, looking forward, singing. The King James Version, top translation, they look at turtle dove, they springtime, and they reason to themselves, okay, we're talking about singing of birds. So they inserted the words of birds into the text. Turtle doves coo, though, they don't sing. Now the Greek Septuagint, looking at the same text, they see backward and they see flowers. So, they, okay, flowers. The, the man is pruning flowers. It's springtime has arrived, and the turtle doves are cooing in the land. That's not what Solomon was talking about here. The whole picture is one of Romeo. He's got a song in his heart that he's going to sing to the love of his life, the turtle dove. And he's pruning flowers to give to her. So he goes to her with the flowers and with the song, and then she responds with cooing. And the reason why the voice of the turtle is heard everywhere is because it's springtime, time of romance, a lot of Romeos, a lot of turtle doves. And it's a beautiful thing. Solomon was actually presenting an entire picture. But look at the way what would happen if you focused, no matter what direction, you lose content. And you need inferential logic to put it together. You have to know it's a Janus, and you have to use your head to think about what's being said here to fill in the gaps, to make the connections. You need that, what John the Apostle would call in the book of Revelation, the mind that has wisdom. You have to put these connections together. And I don't know what Cyrus Gordon says about this context. That's the way I see it. I didn't buy his book. I'm sorry. Now here is the Janus in Matthew 16, 18, briefly stated, we'll go through each premise later. Top left, there in Hebrew characters, is the Aramaic word for firstborn. When transliterated into Greek, it's spelt precisely like Petro's stone. When Christ saw that Peter had confessed divine revelation, is born again, he declares, you really are firstborn of the divine revelation. And then looking forward, he sees him as the cave of stone, but there is the intervention of the church. The church must be built first. The resurrection of Christ has to uh, come first before the keys even exist. But the keys do imply that he will be in a Kepha, Petra, Petros, water-bearing relationship with Christ. That is what's suggested by the apposition of Petros and Petra, that there is a relationship, a later, lesser to greater analogy. And that's what happens there in 1 Peter. Peter has the living stone and lively stone. So he transferred to the church that same water-bearing relationship. We'll get into that later. But it's right here. It's what obscures the genus is the linear timeline that we have to follow the resurrection of Christ intervenes. But Petros is that Janus hominum, and it is looking forward. The keys imply that Peter will be the Petros Kepha, water-bearing lethos rock in the church, part of that channel of God's grace, so he'll have the keys that can open the door into heaven. Once that channel is established, there's the keys, and there's Peter. The keys do not exist apart from the channel of God's grace. Therefore, when Peter received the keys, it implies he had become a Kepha Petros lively stone of the church. 
And since Cyrus Gordon discovered Janus parallelisms, they've been finding them everywhere in the Old Testament. I think the same thing is going to happen in the New. In fact, I have a few that I'm going to suggest for the list, but it's by no means exhaustive. I've been focused on this and also cab driving. This is like the echo of a Janus, a, a ripple from an actual Janus tossed into the lake. Because Christ created this two-way perspective when he said, you are Petros, and it was also surnaming Simon Petros Stone at the same time, so that he became a Kepha Petros water-bearing rock, this Janus exists. Whatsoever you bind on earth or loose on earth shall be bound or loosed in heaven. But there is no actual hominem here, the implied Peter looking back, God looking forward is not only possible, but it's not in the text. But this echo of a Janus is here precisely because there is a Janus in Matthew 16, 18. Now here is another near Janus. Peter has applied to the church the Janus parallelism, Matthew 16, 18. The church has now got a relationship with Christ, a living stone, lively stone relationship. As newborn babes, they have tasted the Lord is gracious. That's looking back. They drank of the living water, which in this figurative language, drinking is like believing. So they believed Christ, now they're saved. Looking forward, they have become the spiritual house the holy priesthood. Now they are lively stones. This is the Janus that Christ established. That duality is right there in Matthew 16, 18. Struck in Billerbeck in their commentary, they mention this Aramaic Petros when commenting on Matthew 10, 2. Protos, earliest Simon. It likely came from the Hebrew word Peter, Strong's 6363, firstborn, first then ling, or that which separates or first opens the womb. Now in Matthew 10 2, Simon is called Protos. Now some thought that meant he was uh, part of a numbering system, so you got first, second, third, but there is no number two, number three. So it's not a numbering system. And then others argued, well, that's referring to his primacy. Well, Matthew and Mark both report after the event in Matthew 16, 18, they were still arguing about who's the greatest in the kingdom. So that clearly is no reference to primacy. That leaves only the most parsimonious interpretation. And you combine this with Matthew 4, 18, where you see that Simon was called Petros before he met Jesus. So we have earliest Simon, the one called firstborn. That would be parsimonious. Now the professor says in the next slide that the Aramaic Petros is here in this, uh, this lectionary. I don't really know. I can't read Aramaic. But I've tried to isolate where it is so I could point it out to you. I could be wrong. But that center column has Matthew 16, 18 in it. It's above Matthew uh, 9, but that's a lectionary. So they took portions of the New Testament and then it's, uh, it's part of this book. So it's not in chronological order here. If you look at that number 18 at center column, you may have to zoom in one line down, counting from right to left, third word over, Petros. Now, if you go up two verses to Matthew 16, 16, one line down, two words over, Petros. I believe it's there. I've done my best to isolate it, but I can't read Aramaic. It all looks kind of like chicken scratch to me. I'm sorry, I'm a cab driver. So we're going to have to rely on the professor in the next slide. He says it's here, and I think he's right. Now, in his book, Peter and the Rock, you look there on page 34, down towards the bottom, you'll see in English, it says, And I say to thee, thou art Petros, 
and on this kepha I shall build my church. And then he comments that these are clearly distinct words. So you're not seeing kepha twice like you usually hear about in that hypothetical Aramaic text that Catholic apologists love to have you focus on to get you away from the Greek, because the Greek is pretty definitive. There's no way the Greek allows Simon to be the rock. Christ is talking to Simon about the female rock. It's like saying, upon her, I will build my church. Oh, that ain't Peter. <laughs> so they have to get you to this hypothetical Aramaic. But here now is a Palestinian Aramaic where the Petros does exist. And if you wanted to see where it is in Hebrew, you count from right to left above the, that English text on the bottom. You one, two, three, four, five, six words over. You got it. There it is. So here in Matthew 4.18, Peter is called Petros before he met Christ. In 4.19, Jesus says, follow me. In John 1.40, Andrew is already called Simon Peter's brother. Petros, before they went to seek out Christ. In Matthew 16, 18, that's the clincher. That's present tense. Jesus said, you are Petros, not that you became Petros, or I'm changing you now to make you into a Petros. And that's in symmetry with you are Christ. So uh, Jesus didn't become Christ at that time. There's also the element that Christ is being revealed as the Son of God. That's something new. And Christ is returning the favor. And you called me that, and now I'm calling you firstborn. That's something new. Yeah, just repeating a point made earlier. Simon is blessed by Christ when he confessed the revelation of God. Clearly, this is unique because this never happened before. And this kind of response from Christ is incredible. All the other times, it was more like a ho-hum. You really believe I'm the Son of God That because I said that? It was really a nothing, a nothing burger before. This one got Christ's attention. And he says, blessed art thou, and then he calls him Bar Jonah. I've already mentioned how I believe that's a prophet, son of the prophet Jonah, Jesus saw that parallel, and he puts it right there, and that confirms that Simon was born again right here in that text in Matthew 16, 16. Now, the indications that he was born again, firstborn, perhaps we could read the keys as implying that the firstborn of the estate gets the keys, but that might be a little stretch because the church gets them too. However, look at that binding and loosing authority, but compare what Peter got to what the apostles got. They had to have at least two in agreement. Peter did not. That implies he had the firstborn, the right of the firstborn, that double portion. So there you have an indication right in the context that Peter is the firstborn of the divine revelation. Jesus is the Christ, son of the living God firstborn of the gospel of Christ. Well, now that we've established Petros Aramaic as firstborn, we're going to turn our attention to Petros Kepha as stone. Confirming that it is a homonym are the two radically different perspectives. Matthew clearly has earliest Simon, the one called firstborn, Whereas Mark and John are looking at it as the equivalent of Kepha, Cephas. Notice what Mark says. Simon was surnamed Petros, just like James and John were surnamed Sons of Thunder. That's a description. That's not really a proper name. And of course, John says Cephas, when interpreted, is a Petros. Now that we've established Petros, firstborn Aramaic exists, let's look at Cephas Petros, the water-bearing rock. John says that Simon would be called Cephas. There's only one place where that happened, 
Matthew 16, 18. That's where that prophecy was fulfilled. He, decades later, explains that a stone, Petros, interprets Cephas. Now, some modern translations have Cephas, when translated, is a Petros. Well, then, Petros, when translated, is a Cephas. And that means this text was fulfilled in Matthew 16, 18. Now, if we want to see what Christ intended when he named, surnamed Simon Cephas, Petros, we have to look at the Aramaic meaning of Cephas. We're not going to find that in the Greek meaning of stone. In Mark's Gospel, the appearance of the names Simon and Petros corroborate that Simon was surnamed Cephas Petros in Matthew 16, 18, not John 1, I've highlighted Mark 8:29 because it approximates the event at Matthew 16:18 when the Janus occurred. Before that time, Mark only uses the name Simon to refer to Peter, except when mentioning the actual surnaming in Mark 3:16 and in 5:37 where it seems Christ is requesting only his closest disciples, Peter, James, and John accompany him as he did in the Garden of Gethsemane. That probably explains Mark's choice of Cephas Petros here because it indicates his close personal connection to the Lord. But look what happens after that line of demarcation, that yellow Matthew 16, 18 event. Simon only appears in the words of Christ, so it doesn't count. Thereafter, a burst of Petros Cephas references. It's really quite startling. This clearly confirms that Simon was surnamed Cephas Petros at Matthew 16:18, not at John 1:42. The Janus event in Matthew 16:18 is the most likely reason why John says Cephas, by interpretation, is a Petros. He should have used Lethos. Just as uh, Peter does in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2 on. He transferred all the meanings of Petros, Petra, and Cephas to Lethos when speaking about Christ and the church. John should have done the same thing because Petros and Petra were Attic Greek. They were archaic, passing into non-use. John is writing this decades after the event. So this definitely is his pointing to Matthew 16, 18 as the place where Simon was given the surname Cephas Petros in agreement with Mark. As we can infer from Isaiah, Genesis, and Revelation, when your relationship with God changes, you get a new name. Peter's relationship changed when he was born again. So it follows that he would get a new name, a water, a, a name that indicates the relationship that he has now entered into with Christ, a water-bearing relationship. Christ is the mass of Petra rock, giving out living water, and Peter is the smaller Kepha rock, out of whose belly is flowing living water. Now, confirming Peter sees the Matthew 16, 18 event, as a Janus parallelism, notice how he carried over here in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 2 through 6, that duality. He's looking back, firstborn, they tasted the living water of the Lord, that he's gracious, and now they are newborn babes desiring sincere milk, and they have become, looking forward, that spiritual house, a holy priesthood. They too are now in that Petra, Petros, relationship, bearing water with Christ. Out of their belly is flowing rivers of living water. So John considers Cephas the equivalent of Petros. Now some modern translations have this verse reading, Cephas, when translated, is Petros, Peter. 
Well, that makes the equivalency even stronger. That means Petros, that appears in Matthew 16, 18, when translated, is a Cephas. Now, if we want to know how Christ was using Cephas Petros when uh, that particular Aramaic was being spoken, we have to look back into the Aramaic texts of that period that reflect that usage to discern that. Well, now we get to the Aramaic usage of Cephas, Kepha, to see exactly how Christ meant it in Matthew 16, 18. Now we're going to go through this at length because it indicates that Peter has transferred to the church the Janus parallelism, the event of Matthew 16, 18. And you could see that uh, not only by the meanings that are transferred from Petra and Petros onto Lithos, but also the relationship that's set up between living stone and lively stone of the church. So let's get cracking. So the Aramaic that Christ and his disciples spoke is reflected in the Talbot and Targums. Kepha is a rock when bored that will give forth water. Pearls, jewels, precious stones, jewelry. He has transferred Petros, Petra, and Kepha meanings not only to Christ, but also to the church. And he's doing it in such a way, it clearly he's, he's thinking about the Matthew 16 event, and he's created his own little sermon here, rewording it slightly, but the relationships are still the same. And he's transferred those meanings that Christ used in Matthew 16, 18, onto the church and Christ himself. Going from the top first, a rock when bored, gives forth water. Kepha. Now in Deuteronomy, the next arrow down, we see Kepha is equivalent to Petra. So they are equivalent. They're both water-bearing rocks. Jonathan, when he sucked honey out of the rock, his uh, strength, his countenance was strengthened, brightened. His eyes were beamed. That's in 1 Samuel 14:27. That's like getting spirit or life from that honey that he sucked out of the rock. Oil out of the flinty rock. Oil often symbolizes Holy Spirit. So you're getting life, divine life, from the flinty rock. So there's the connection with the imagery of living water. It's like saying you're getting spirit from the rock. And we see that reflected, bottom arrow, that living stone, lively stone relationship that Christ established right there in Matthew 16, 18, the Petra, Petros, big stone, little stone relationship. It's a water-bearing relationship, a life-bearing relationship. The living water comes from Christ, goes through the uh, lively stones of the church, Peter being one of them, and then out of their belly flows rivers of living water. There's the logic of the entire uh, symbolism. Oil, spirit, life from the flinty rock. Spiritual rock. Christ is that spiritual life-giving rock from whom flows living water. Moses was supposed to strike the rock once and then out of it would come water and all who drank lived. Well, he kind of blew that one. But we see the Petra appears in the Greek Septuagint of this text, that context, there's the connection. Now, lest someone create a straw man over the use of Petra for Christ, the metaphor is apt. It, Petra, rock, is anything immutable. Now, Christ himself applied it to his sayings, and we know that he also applied it to the revelation that the Father gave to Peter, that's two times, two different objects. And if Paul adds Christ himself a third to the list, there is no contradiction. Let's uh, sideline that possible straw man right now. Now, when I discussed the metaphorical rock earlier in this video, strictly to show people the keys of the kingdom, I didn't mention that it is a Janus. Petra, in this context, is a Janus. It has duality. It is the rock upon which the church is built, but that's looking forward. 
looking back, it is the sayings of life. Oil from the flinty rock, life, the spiritual drink from the Petra rock that followed the children of Israel in the wilderness. If you hear the sayings of Christ, you shall live. Same if you hear the Petra of God, that Jesus is the Christ, son of the living God. You're drinking from that mass of Petra, you will live. A Kepa is also a precious stone. Notice the Septuagint has gracious wage. That's like a stone that uh, results in grace. And because it, you, if you give that to the ruler of the land, then you can prosper. He won't uh, send his armies out to kill you, I guess. But notice uh, Peter transferred that idea of precious to Christ. And in a sense, Christ is our precious stone because, you know, the blood of the lamb turns aside the wrath of God. So uh, you could say he's our precious stone. From him we get grace. So the equivalent drinking is believing. Believing is drinking in this kind of imagery. You have the newborn babes. They tasted the Lord as gracious. Well, that means they believed in him and then they were born again. Same thing. So in this duality, this parallelism, we have to keep in mind the two different perspectives of time. There is the eternal perspective where on the bottom, even though we're still on earth, we're already seated in heavenly places. So from God's perspective, all these things are past. Christ, when he saw uh, Peter confess that he was the Christ, right then he became firstborn, but he also became the Kepha Petros water-bearing rock of the future that uh, in our time wouldn't happen until after Christ rose from the dead. But right there is when he was surnamed Kepha Petros, that's when John 142 was fulfilled. You shall be called Cephas Petros. And that's where it happened, Matthew 16, 18. And the interval of the church and the gates of hell is not a contradiction to this. That's actually more like a statement of events. This is the progress. This is how the timeline will go. You get uh, your firstborn now. And you will be that water-bearing rock after I rise from the dead and create the church. The keys do not exist apart from the channel of God's grace. Therefore, when Peter received the keys, it implies he had become a Kepha Petros, lively stone of the church. So, for hundreds, maybe thousands of years, these asymmetric Janus parallelisms were all over the Old Testament and nobody knew it. Until Cyrus Gordon in 1978, he pointed them out. Now they're finding them everywhere. I think the same thing's going to happen in the New Testament. We're going to see a lot of Janus parallelisms and near Janus parallelisms. Like I found here in Matthew 16:19 which is the ripple of an actual Janus there in Matthew 16, 18. Christ created that duality, and like a ripple in time, we see the duality carry forward into the binding and loosing authority of the church. That's in the past. We have Peter looking forward as God. He does it in heaven. Again, the duality that Christ created in Matthew 16, 18 gets applied to the church. They are looking back, newborn babes, because they tasted the living water that the Lord is gracious. Just like Peter, when he was born again, he believed. Looking forward, now they are lively stones in that Petra, Petros, Kepha, water-bearing relationship with Christ, built up in a spiritual household, a holy priesthood, communicating the grace of God to the earth. Now, of course, this lowly cabbie wants to be the first to discover yet another Janus parallelism in the New Testament. And I want to be part of the race. Revelation 13, 18. That is an asymmetric Janus parallelism on the number 666. John is using double entendre. He's saying count 
to the number of the beast. Count meaning, as with pebbles, it's a simple matter of subtraction. You've got to subtract Adonicum's father, who's named Adonicum, and then you get the number 666 there in Ezra, I mean, uh, in Neremiah 718. Now, it is the number of a man, because Adonicum, his son, has 666 kids, so it's the number of a man. He generated that number by having all those children. So you get 666 looking forward. Backward, forward, there's your duality, your parallelism. There's your asymmetric. That's the solution. The name of the beast will be Adonicum. So there is an overwhelming mass of irrefutable evidence. Should convince everyone beyond any reasonable doubt that Matthew 16, 18 happened. The reason why the other uh, gospel writers didn't mention it, you needed to construct that parallelism perfectly for it to work. And they left that to Matthew. He'd done a superb job at keeping the timeline of events in there. He kept that uh, greater to lesser analogy. Everything is perfect there. It's incredible what he did. The other writers, clearly, they just left it to him because it would have been difficult. And it's clear from all the other indications that it's authentic scripture. The Janus alone, while being the most elegant proof of it, we have all these other corroborations that the event happened. I already mentioned a few. Second, uh, First Peter chapter 2, verses 2 through 6. We have... Uh, John 142, he's clearly pointing to the event. Then here you have in Romans, clearly Paul has reworked that material, and he has uh, bringing Christ down from above as being the Father, revealing Peter to Peter, the Petra of God, thou art the Christ, Son of the living God. And that is the word of faith, that is divine revelation, and the word that the apostles preach, the Lord Jesus. You have the identity of Christ, the Lord Jesus, confess publicly, you believe it in your heart, you confess it with your mouth, you're saved. Upon that, the church is built. You can't get more proof that the text is authentic scripture. All the scholarship that doubted this, they, it needs to be reevaluated. How high do you want to consider these, these people in your estimation of truth? Or who can show you the truth? But clearly, they have misled a lot of people. For a long time, it's almost like, uh, it, to me, it recalls what uh, Nebuchadnezzar said to his soothsayers. You people have been here and you're all frauds. If you can't tell me what I dreamed. You can't tell me the truth. Then, obviously, you've been here under false pretenses. That's the way I look at a lot of this. They're not critical thinkers. They, they missed all these indications that they're wrong. And they ignored it. And instead of asking themselves, well, gee, this looks imprecise. The Greek is kind of fuzzy. The metaphors don't work. Instead of questioning their interpretation, they question the authenticity of the verse of Scripture. And that really is a serious error. So once that knowledge of the Petros, that Aramaic Petros, was lost, 1618 became ambiguous. They weren't sure exactly what it was pointing to whether it was pointing to Peter, or his confession, or Christ, or the specific teaching that he is the Christ, the Son of God, and some even thought it was uh, the apostles. So that's what happened in history. That precision was lost. But you regain it once you realize that Petros, that Aramaic Petros, which is spelled precisely like the Greek, Petros, meaning stone, is right there. Christ is using both meanings. He's looking back at uh, Peter as first, firstborn, and then he's looking forward at Peter as the rock, the safest rock. Once you realize that, precision is restored to the context. Jesus Christ is our Lord, our teaching authority. To be consistent with that profession, 
we have to follow what he says. And the way he set up Matthew 7, 24, 25, where he used the same basic symbols, the same basic figurative language, same theme, you're building upon a rock with divine truth, you have to follow that when you get to Matthew 16, 16 through 18. To do anything else is inconsistent. And that is not good. Well, this is here because I promised to put it back in, but uh, it's poorly written. Whether it actually contributes much, uh, that's debatable. But there it is. Let's move on. Well, that's a wrap. But look at this one last verse. Jesus is the Christ, Son of God. John wrote that if you believe that, you will have life through his name. So clearly, that is how Christ is building his church, one soul at a time, as they believe that and confess with their mouth publicly that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and then they are saved. That's the word of faith. That's how the church is being built. It's not on Peter. It's not on his confession. It's not on anything else. It's on that divine revelation that the Father gave to Peter, and then he confessed it publicly, and Christ declared him blessed, and he will declare you blessed. When you confess Jesus before men, Jesus confesses you before his Father in heaven. So you have to do this publicly. Publicly is how you confess the Petra of God, and then you're yoked with him. And uh, even if you, you fail a little bit in life, just like Peter did, you have eternal security. Because we know that even after Peter denied Christ three times, he didn't lose his salvation. Paul says if we deny him, he can't deny himself. And that's eternal security of the believer. www.endtimenews.net Go there, check it out. I got a lot of end time stuff. A lot of it sounds a little fantastic. Well, that's all right. I truly believe the generation that's alive in that seven year period at the end of time, they're going to see some of the stuff I predicted because it's taught in scripture. It's not from me. And it's, I believe it's very clear, clearly taught. But you, you have to accept some pretty radical new stuff that in the past people wouldn't believe, you know, about extraterrestrials. There are no extraterrestrials, by the way. There's either good angels or bad angels. And the bad angels are going to come here claiming to be extraterrestrial, and they're going to convince a lot of people not to believe in God anymore, and that's going to be a strong delusion. But if you want to read about that, go to my site, check it out. Otherwise, this video is a wrap. Peace be unto you. And if you don't believe the extraterrestrial stuff, hey, that's fine. Believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Believing that, you will have life through his name. Peace be to you.